Hi everyone, thanks for stopping by. I'm Bob Polinsky, Master of Wine. If you've been watching my previous videos, thank you very much for the support. If you're new to this channel, I'm hoping this video will convince you to subscribe. And if you feel like doing so, just hit that red button down in the bottom of the screen and it'll get you synced in with all my upcoming videos. The topic for today is what drives the price difference between a cheap and an expensive bottle of wine? This topic looks to be well covered on YouTube, but I'm looking to bring a different perspective to the conversation. I spent nearly 20 years working in corporate roles with large retail chains, both in the US and in Australia, with a prime responsibility of building out private label wines. To this day, I'm still doing some work with some branded wines in terms of sourcing, blending, working with winemaking teams, and so on. Over the years, I've specced out nearly every expense associated with producing a bottle of wine, sometimes down to the penny. Within this video, I'm going to focus on those key points that drive that price differential between cheap and expensive bottles of wine. And in terms of illustrating the point, the video is going to conclude with a wine tasting of two different wines, one that has a $10 and one that has a $150 U.S. retail. So I'm going to talk a little bit about costs as they are connected to the vineyard itself, also the winemaking process, the packaging will be discussed to some degree, and then a brief mention on two other factors that are really important. One is the route to market, and what I mean by that is how does the wine get from the winemaker to you being the end consumer, and then a bit on marketing as well. Also, I'm going to include a video that I took several years ago, and it gives you a very good indication of what harvested fruit looks like for opening price point wine. One of the most important factors that determines the cost of a bottle of wine is the vineyard source. Essentially, where is that fruit coming from? It's like the old adage with real estate, location, location, location. Very true in the wine world. Give you an example. If you head north of where I live, up in the Napa Valley, there you could find an acre of unplanted land with good vineyard potential. They could easily be a million dollars plus for that piece of land. Versus if you were in the Central Valley in Chile or up in the Columbia Valley in Washington, that same piece of land that has good potential to produce solid wine, that, that land is going to sell for a tiny fraction of the cost. That also carries over to the cost of the raw fruit coming off of that vineyard. Again, up in Napa, to use that as an example, easily a, a ton of fruit could be several thousands of dollars, where in these other areas, it may only be a few hundred dollars. Also, the yield levels or the amount of fruit coming off a vineyard can vary tremendously. To use that Napa example, a prime vineyard in Napa may only be pulling two tons of fruit off an acre of land versus a very high volume, uh, more of a, a bulk wine region they can be pulling up to 20 tons an acre. So to give you an idea of what that means in terms of finished bottles of wine, and a ton of fruit equals about 69 liter cases of wine. The Napa example would be 120 cases coming off an acre, where the high volume area, it could be as many as 1,200 cases off an acre of land. The fruit character and quality is largely gonna drive the foundation of a particular wine. Those best wines are always gonna show a sense of place. They have a true sense of origin. Lesser wines are rarely gonna show that characteristic. There is a premium that will be paid for those areas that have that sense of place. For cheaper and more expensive wines, there's a stark difference in terms of how a vineyard is tended to. For the lower end, less, less expensive wines, oftentimes there's much more mechanization that's happening out in the vineyards. Uh, pruning, harvesting, so on, typically done by machine. There's also less quality control points along the growing season. There's simply not enough financial return for there to be that input. Versus a higher end, more expensive wine, oftentimes those vineyards are going to be tended to in a much more meticulous, detailed manner. There's more attention to each of the quality control points during the course of a growing season. Typically, pruning will, will be done by hand. Uh, leaf pulling may be done during the course of the year to balance the vine. Green harvesting may happen. They may actually go into the vineyard before harvest and drop entire clusters of fruit, again, to make sure that the remaining fruit is optimally uh, ripe. 
Hand harvesting also typically takes place. And with that hand harvesting, usually the fruit's going into very shallow bins to get that fruit to the most pristine condition back to the winery. Here's an example of hand harvested fruit. You'll notice that the clusters are placed in the shallow bins. The workday begins at dawn and ends before the hottest part of the day. Conversely, here's an example of machine harvested fruit being brought in for a very inexpensive wine. The process is much less selective in terms of fruit quality. Also, this fruit is being brought in at the hottest part of the day. The fruit is piled high into the back of a truck, which means the fruit on top crushes the fruit on the bottom, which causes oxidation risk. At the end, you'll notice this green material, leaves and sticks and so on. This is commonly called mog, matter other than grapes. So that last video clip, there's a peek behind the curtain. Now, many large wineries, those that produce varying quality levels of prestige, medium, down to entry level, oftentimes they will grade their vineyard sites. Uh, a through D is fairly common, a little bit like the old grade school method. The A's are those ultra premium sites. Lower yields, they're always gonna get a, a much higher uh, bottle price. The yields tend to be low. There's much more input into what's going on in the vineyards. At that lower end, generally these are very low input in the vineyards. The yields are much higher because the wines hit a very low price point. At this point, we're going from the vineyard to the winery. You saw a bit of what happened in the one example with the very low end. With the high end, with the expensive wines, oftentimes the next step is this. The fruit is brought into the winery on a slow moving conveyor belt. Over that conveyor belt is a team of people that are pulling out any type of, of bits of material that shouldn't be there, any type of fruit that's not in the best condition, with the thought being that pristine fruit is needed to make the very best quality wine. Another key consideration in the winery is the use of oak. Now, many of the very inexpensive wines will see no time in oak whatsoever. And if they do get any oak influence at all, it's typically not going to be from an oak barrel. It may be through oak chips, it may be through some sort of oak extract, which is even cruder, but these are very inexpensive ways to introduce some sort of oak element into the wine. At the higher end, oftentimes what you'll find is the wines are gonna be aged for an extended period of time in oak, oftentimes a fairly high percentage of new oak, and the turnaround time for, for that low end wine, it may only be a few months from the time the fruit is harvested to the time the wine is actually ready to be released. With many higher end wines, it can be a year or even two years or more before wine is released. So in that case, you can see how there's an expense in terms of holding inventory for a very long period of time. Therefore, that's reflected in the price of the wine as well. Before jumping into the tasting, I'm briefly going to discuss the packaging of these two wines and how they play into the shelf cost. Now the first wine that I'm gonna be trying is something I actually have, have never heard of. It's called Colt Ridge Vineyards. I picked this up at total for $10. It's a 2020 Cabernet Sauvignon from South Australia. I'm sure this is one of their private labels. Very inexpensive packaging, uh, lightweight glass, simple label, not textured, screw cap closure, the cheapest version that you can find. I'm sure this was specced out to the penny. The other wine that's gonna be tasted is the Brands and Son Kunawara Sanctuary Cabernet Sauvignon 2019. Uh, if you look at the packaging on this, there's a lot of expense involved. It's heavy glass, deep punt, textured label, etching on the, on the bottle itself. The uh, wax capsule is, is also gonna add significant cost. I would venture to guess that the packaging for this wine is probably more than the total cost of the first. Before tasting the first wine, I'm briefly going to discuss the route to market and marketing and how that impacts the price of wine. It's very convoluted. Uh, in, in terms of the route to market, what I mean is how does the wine get from the wine producer to the ultimate uh, end consumer? It's a convoluted mess. And it's tough to speak to this on this channel because there's so many different scenarios that play out around the world. In some places, there's monopolies. In other places, there's many middlemen between uh, the wine and, and the actual consumer. In some cases, it's actually quite clean and direct. So keep in mind that that route to market is very different depending on where you're at in the world. Also, the marketing side of it, 
look, it's a consumer product and there's plenty of examples out there where really bad wines have been built up through marketing. That's just what happens from time to time. What I try to focus on are those wines that really don't play up the marketing aspect, the wines that stand on their own merits. Now, the first wine that I'm going to be tasting uh, is that one that was built to a price point, spec'd out, I would say, to the penny. Very much like what I would expect with the old style Australian wines that you'd find flooding the market 25 years ago. Uh, the color on this wine is not all that deep. There's some fade as you get out to the rim. And you'll notice that the color looks a little bit muddled. It's not real clear. Uh, that's a key example that you'll find in many warm climate wines. This being South Australian, I'm sure this was coming from some very hot areas. The alcohol level is 14.5. In terms of the aromatics, there's some red fruit character, but it's more of a stewed fruit. It's a little jammy. Uh, I'm not getting any indication of oak whatsoever. On the palate, very simple, direct. There's some good fruit intensity there. A bit overripe. You do get a bit of alcoholic heat. Uh, tannins are very, very soft. This is really very much an old school style of, of Australian wine. This is something that I could have seen being quite popular 25 years ago. Second wine is a completely different story. While the first is built to a price point, this is built with no expense spared. Uh, if you see the color, the color is almost opaque. Very good extension of color to the rim of the glass. It has this very vibrant, uh, youthful appearance, a bit of a purpley hue as well. Aromatics have fantastic intensity, uh, purity. You can tell the fruit quality is extremely good. There's a bright uh, spice character to it. It has that cassis fruit, that blackberry character, a uh, good amount of oak, high quality oak that's very seamlessly integrated. Wine spends two years in oak. Uh, outstanding aromatics. And I would imagine with a little bit of time, this, this bottle is actually going to open up and show more character. On the palate, sensational. Beautiful purity, good length, presence, front, mid, back palate. Uh, tannins are evident, but they're very polished, refined tannins. And the oak level, again, is, is just uh, adds complexity and, and richness and nuance to the wine. Absolutely love this. It has a bit of that Kunawara character with a touch of that eucalyptus. It's understated, but it's certainly there. This is a wine that has a very strong sense of place. Thank you so much for staying to the end of this video. If you have some ideas on future videos that you'd like to see, please post it down in the comments section. I'd love to hear from you. I think you can guess which wine I'm going to be drinking tonight. I hope you're drinking something great as well. And until next time, cheers.